we had uh, covered in earlier chapters, the nature of the godly soul and the nature of the natural soul or the ungodly soul. And we were told that uh, the godly is transparent, which is a definition of holiness. The word kedusha or kadosh in Hebrew can best be translated as transparent because that's what holy means. Holy means that which is transparent of self and allows the Creator to, uh, to show, to be visible through it. Or in more practical terms, uh, the ability to put oneself aside in a, in a transparent way, not with any ambition of self-importance uh, or self-aggrandizement, but to put oneself aside transparently in, in favor of the uh, godly, the moral, the good, the commandment, the mitzvah. Everything else, that which is not transparent, is called unholy or non-holy, which seems to be kind of a shocking statement. Everything under the sun that is not a commandment, that is not in act or thought or speech in the service of God, is unholy, is the other side, the shell that hides the holiness. The reason it hides the holiness is because the holiness within it is in exile. It can't express itself freely. And so it's imprisoned there like a fruit is imprisoned by its shell. This is why the Rebbe says, this is why this world, the physical universe, is described as a world of klipa, as an unholy world. What is the unholiness of it? not necessarily vile, ugly, evil. The unholiness is that the physical universe is self-conscious. It's self-aware. It draws attention to itself. It is not transparent. So, for example, a piece of parchment, a piece of leather, is not transparent. It's very visible. It draws attention to itself. It takes up room. It occupies its own space to the exclusion of everything else it's very much opaque, not transparent. But when you take a piece of parchment and you write a mezuzah, you, tr you make a mitzvah out of it, then the parchment um, of the mezuzah disappears. It becomes transparent. You see right past the parchment to the mitzvah, to the godliness of it. So the little piece of parchment becomes an object of godliness rather than a piece of leather. That's why the world is called the world of Klippa, because it's primarily a self-conscious world. In the unholy, which is defined or described as the things God creates as a means to an end, but are not in themselves uh, what God desires, among the things that are called unholy, there are two different kinds. There is that which is completely unholy, uh, completely opaque. And then there is the unholy that is unholy because it's not transparent, but it's also not totally opaque. It's kind of translucent. Um, if there's a light behind it, you will know that there is a light there. You won't be able to see the shape and the uh, details or the particulars of that light, but you will see a brightness. So it allows some visibility, but not complete visibility. This is called the bright klipa, the shell that, that is somewhat cooperative or somewhat um, surrendered to the uh, meat within it, to the fruit within it. You might say it's a shell, but it's edible. Not as delicious as the fruit itself, but edible. Whereas the completely unredeemable klipa, or husk, is the inedible kind of shell. 
like, like the shells of a nut. All the things that are from the completely unredeemable dark klipa, uh, which include those foods that are incompatible with holiness and are therefore forbidden, um, activities that are forbidden, like uh, working on Shabbos or stealing or uh, cheating, all of these things are forbidden. The Hebrew word is asur, which means chained, tied. These things are so deeply unholy that they don't allow themselves to be marshaled, to be drafted into the service of God. They won't allow themselves to be used in a holy fashion. Whereas those things that are permissible, such as vegetables that are uh, not stolen and also not, uh, not planted against the commandment, for example, of mixing uh, grapes and planting grapes and wheat in the same field. If there is no prohibition involved, those things are called mutar, which means untied, literally untied. Untied means it's unholy, but it is not tied to unholiness. It is available for holy purposes. Now, those things that are available for holy purposes come from that translucent kind of unholiness that is the uh, intermediary between what is truly unholy and what is truly godly and holy. And so being an intermediary, it can really go either way. When used for a godly purpose, it becomes part and parcel of the godliness and of the goodness. So, for example, if a person is eating, but with a heavenly purpose, not to fulfill, to satisfy his appetite, not simply because he wants to, and not even because he has to in order to survive. So even the most necessary, the most justified uh, human activity, necessary for human survival, is still unholy, even though necessary. What would make these activities holy? If the person eats not merely to survive and to be healthy, but to be healthy in the service of God. If you're living a life of godliness, if you're serving God, and then you eat in order to continue that life, then the eating becomes part of the service. You're actually eating for God's sake. Because what are you going to do after you finish eating? How are, you going to, how are you going to use the energy that you're deriving from this food and from the pleasure of the food? You're going to use it to serve God. So, indirectly, one step removed, the act of eating becomes part of the mitzvah that you're going to uh, perform, the commandment you're going to observe um, a few moments from now. Another possibility, more direct possibility, is when you're eating not, not in order to be healthy, not even in order to be able to serve God better, but you're eating on Shabbos itself or on Yom Tov itself, on a holiday, to fulfill the commandment of enjoying the holiday. So on Shabbos, for example, it is actually a mitzvah to eat. And if a person is eating because it is Shabbos, then the, then the act of the eating is itself directly an act of a mitzvah. And then this food, which had you eaten the same food on Wednesday or, or some other day of the week, it would be a translucent unholiness. But on Shabbos, because it is a mitzvah and you're using it to do the mitzvah, it becomes itself transparent, positive, actual holiness. <clears throat> the things that are forbidden um, cannot become part of a mitzvah, cannot be redeemed and elevated, made heavenly by using it for heavenly purposes. The only way 
that that which is forbidden, prohibited, that which is from the truly uh, opaque klipa, or husk, or shell, the only way that that can be redeemed is through repentance, through tshuva. But not even ordinary tshuva. It would have to be the kind of tshuva that is called love tshuva. Repenting out of love, not out of fear, um, not out of embarrassment, but out of love. Which means something like this. A person commits a sin, even intentionally, violates a commandment, and then regrets it. What is he regretting? Is he regretting the fact that he failed himself, he disappointed himself, he thought of himself as a better person and now realizes that he's not as good as he thought? Which can be very shocking, it can be very sobering, and causes you to repent or to regret. And then you won't repeat that sin again because it's, it's too degrading. A person can regret a sin because of fear. What are the consequences going to be? What is this going to cost me? What is this doing to my relationship with God, to my relationship with, with others who are, who are good and innocent? The price is too steep. And so you regret the sin because, because you regret the price. That's a legitimate regret. It's a legitimate repentance. It's legitimate tshuva. You are forgiven for your sins. God no longer um, is angry at you or holds it against you. But the sin remains an unholy thing. It does not become part of, of the holiness. By the way, even a permissible activity that um, that was indulged in without holy purpose, without heavenly intent, the next time you do a mitzvah that uses the energy that you gained from the food you ate, even though you weren't at the time eating it for a heavenly purpose, will also be drawn into the mitzvah and will, after the fact, become part of the mitzvah, become part of the commandment, because you're actually using that energy to fulfill the commandment. Even then, when the food becomes holy because you're using it for a holy purpose, after the fact, yet some trace of unholiness will remain and that's why, according to Kabbalah, there is suffering in the grave. And when a person passes away, there's a painfulness, there's a discomfort in the grave because the soul is trying to shed that uh, trace of unholiness that lingers from all the times that we indulged in human activity without a redeeming godly purpose. Now, when the activity is not permissible, but actually prohibited, then even if we do a mitzvah with the energy that we got from that food, it does not become part of holiness unless we do a tshuva out of love, repentance out of love. And what that means is, and here's how, how the Rebbe describes it in the Rebbe's words, when a person does the kind of tshuva, the kind of repentance that comes from love, from the depths of the heart, with a great love, with a longing and a thirst, a thirsting soul, to connect to God, to get back to God. And his soul thirsts for godliness, like a person who had been out in the desert, in a place of, of desolation and death, thirsts for water. If he has that kind of regret, then the intentional sin which he committed becomes itself part of godliness. It becomes holy. And that's because the sin is what is intensifying his desire to be good. Now, usually, one of the symptoms or one of the consequences of sin, uh, we are told, is that one sin brings another. 
there's a certain um, insensitivity or callousness that a sin causes or creates in the person so that once you've committed a sin you're more likely to commit another one because you're not sense you're desensitized um, so one sin brings another that's the nature of sin but when a person regrets the sin with this kind of a love with this kind of a thirsting because he feels so alienated and so distant from godliness and from holiness so it's the sin the distance that is making him repent, that is making him want to get closer to God, that is now fueling his desire and his pleasure and his thirst for everything holy and good. And so instead of the sin bringing another sin, instead of making him less sensitive, it's actually sensitizing him greater, more than that sensitivity that a person who never sinned might have. And that's why the Baal Tshuva, the person returning to godliness after having been away, is in some way superior, closer, better than the saint who had never sinned at all. Because the saint yearns for godliness because of the attraction that godliness holds. He doesn't have this intense thirsting because he's never been far away. The person who had committed a sin, who has experienced distance and alienation from God, now experiences an intensified love, which the Rebbe calls a great love. What is the greatness of this love? It's not the, ab the average or the normal or the uh, predictable love that one has for everything good and, and, and sweet and holy. It's an intensified love that can only come from having lost it for a while, for having been away. And that's why he describes it as a person coming out of a desert. Not a person thirsty who lives in his house and hasn't gotten around to taking a drink. That thirst is not an intense thirst because he knows there's water and he knows where to get it. An intense thirst is that of a person who is in a place of thirst, a place of desolation. The thirst there is much more intense because he knows that there is nothing to drink. Now, that thirsting, intensified by the absence of goodness, is actually coming from the sin itself. So the sin has now rebounded and instead of drawing the person away from all that is godly, it is pushing the person towards a much greater godliness, a more intense godliness. And so it is having the effect of a mitzvah. Because ordinarily, what is the effect of a mitzvah? What is the nature of a mitzvah? One mitzvah brings another mitzvah. That when you do, a com when you fulfill a commandment, when you observe a commandment, it whets your appetite for more godliness, for more commandments, to do another mitzvah, to do the mitzvah again. That's the nature of a mitzvah. If, in this case, the, the, the sin that he had committed in the past is now drawing him to do more mitzvahs, then the sin is behaving like a mitzvah. It's having the effect of a mitzvah. It's a sin that brings a mitzvah in its path. And so the sin has become part and parcel of godliness. But that's only through this great, intense tshuva. So when a person commits a sin and draws to himself this unholiness, which is the source of life and existence for the sin, as we were saying earlier, God invests a very restricted, re reduced, diminished part of himself into that which is unholy. And so when we, when we engage in those things that are unholy, we're actually drawing energy and life from the unholy that creates these thoughts or these speech words or, or activities. To get rid of that unholiness, 
will either take a great repentance in the case of an activity that was forbidden, or the next time we do something positive with the energy that we gained from the unholy activity, such as eating uh, permissible food, kosher food, um, food that was, uh, that was not stolen or, or, uh, or gained illegally, then the unholiness that that produced is redeemed simply by doing the next mitzvah, by using the energy for a godly purpose. And so elevating the world, raising the world towards godliness, means bringing that which is unholy back to the, uh, the inner self of God, with which he creates the, the, the transparent and the holy things in the world, and thereby making even the lowest part of the physical existence, of the physical creation, even that part which does not by itself, by its nature, by its creation, uh, express holiness, we can bring it to express holiness, we can make it part of holiness, depending on how we use it. And so this is a very basic fundamental statement um, early on in the teachings of Hasidus and, and the Tanya, that our job and our role and our responsibility in the world is not only to remain on the side of goodness and to en engage in, in all that is holy and positive, but more than that, to bring into the holy that which is not yet holy. And we do this by giving all of our activities all our thoughts, all our speech, and all our deeds, a heavenly purpose, a godly purpose. Such, for example, how do we give speech a heavenly purpose? The Deborah brings the example of the teacher, the, the, the sage of, of, of the Talmud, who before he began teaching his daily Torah lesson, he would first... Um, stimulate the minds of the students and, and I guess of himself uh, by asking a, uh, a riddle, um, asking for uh, what we might call biblical trivia questions to stimulate the mind with a, with a uh, less demanding subject before digging into the meat of the, of the teachings, into the uh, more difficult part of the lesson. Now, this light-hearted remark, or this riddle, or this biblical trivia thing, it is not itself the study of Torah. It is not a commandment. It is not fulfilling any mitzvah. And yet, it is part of holiness. It is included in godliness itself because it stimulates the mind so that the Torah can be studied with greater uh, awareness, with greater understanding, with greater... Um, mental agility. So all activity that helps us in the service of God, whether it's thought, speech, or deed, becomes part of holiness. So that not only are we doing ourselves a favor, not only is it good for, for the person himself, but it actually uh, refines the world, it softens the condition of unholiness, allowing even the unholy to become part of godliness, to become part of holy. So that the translucent, we might say, gets cleaned up so that it too becomes transparent. Now the opaque, that's a little more difficult. There, we're not permitted to purposely, intentionally violate a commandment with a heavenly intention so that we can redeem the, uh, the unholy and turn the opaque into transparent. That doesn't work. That can't work. Uh, that's why it's called prohibited. Well, that's why it is prohibited. The prohibition is telling you, you cannot use this for a heavenly purpose. But in the, uh, in the event where a person had committed a sin, not for heavenly purposes, but because he was attracted to the pleasures of the sin. Then, 
there is a way of redeeming not only oneself, but even the sin itself, the unholiness of the act, the unholiness of the, of the speech and of the thought, by doing a tshuva out of love, a repentance out of love. And um, the, the advantage, the gain, the benefit, the profit, that one uh, gains in doing this kind of a tshuva is what makes the returnee greater than the saint, greater than the tzaddik. The bal tshuva is greater than the tzaddik. Again, for two reasons. Number one, because the bal tshuva experiences a desire for godliness, a longing for godliness, an intensity with which to do God's commandments that the tzaddik never feels, never experiences, in fact may even be envious of the, uh, of the bal tshuva. So that's a personal benefit. The feeling, the experience that the bal tshuva has is more intense, more... Uh, more thirsting for godliness than the tzaddik. But secondly, what the Baal Tshuva does for the forbidden, for that which is completely beyond the pale of God's will and of God's desire and is therefore prohibited in the occasion where the person has sinned but returned, not only does he intensify his own experience of godliness, but he actually has managed to turn the completely dark klipa, the opaque, into something not only acceptable, not only translucent, but actually transparent. The sin of yesterday has become the mitzvah of today through this process of tshuva. We have a Sunday night program for VIPs that you might be interested in. It's informal, it's questions and answers, it's conversation. It's really relaxed, it's really pleasant, enjoyable, informative, and uh, kind of community-like. It's a Sunday night program, there's a um, Wednesday morning program for the VIPs, and there's a Wednesday night program. All of it, just conversation, casual, laid back, unscripted. So join us, take a look, click uh, the link below, and see which, which of the three suits you best, and join us for some enjoyable conversation.